Hello and welcome to Everyday Mystic, an aid to your spiritual growth. Gurdjieff posited that we, as human beings, do not have a stable self-identity, but rather comprise a set of different personalities. Different personalities will be active at different times, depending on the circumstances, the mood the individual is in, and what happens to occupy his or her mind at the time, among other factors. In Beelzebub's tales to his grandson, Gurdjieff emphasizes that one of the significant impediments to our self-realization is the pervasive automatism in our lives. We tend to react involuntarily to external events, under the influence of our various personalities. This automatism, as Gurdjieff perceives it, results from the abnormal conditions for human existence, engendered by our lack of knowledge of biological and cosmic laws. I've looked into these cosmic laws and to be quite honest, apart from a few, such as the law of three, which I think can be seen by observing reality, many of them are obscure, difficult to grasp, and difficult to figure out whether or not they hold up to scrutiny. Considering that Gurdjieff was a bit of a trickster, it's entirely possible that he even threw in some nonsense just to see what people would do with it. But that's of course just speculation. Luckily, Gurdjieff and other fourth-way teachers do not require knowledge about these laws to start breaking free from our mechanicalness. Mechanicalness, by the way, is the fitting word that Gurdjieff used to describe our normal state. It's simply input-output governed by pre-programmed patterns of thought and behavior. Thus, to break free from this automated existence and to embrace the opportunity for conscious development, we need self-observation. But what does self-observation mean in Gurdjieff's teachings? Self-observation, as proposed by Gurdjieff, is not a mere passive watching of oneself. It is a deeply active and conscious process. It is about seeing ourselves objectively, without judgment, noticing our reactions, emotions, and thoughts as they occur. It is to realize that we are not our thoughts, emotions, or reactions, but we are the observer of them. If you've listened to many of my other videos, this is a recurring theme, both when it comes to other teachers that I study, and with regards to the conclusions that I have drawn from studying my own mind. When we observe ourselves, we start to see our various personalities and how they take turns governing our behavior. You might notice how one moment you can be calm and rational, and the next moment, you are driven by anger or anxiety. Through self-observation, you begin to see the transient nature of these personalities and realize that they are not you, while you, in your unconscious state, tell yourself that this somehow is perfectly coherent and that these reactions are part of your identity and who you are. And the funny thing is that, even when we know all of these things, we can still watch ourselves behave in this manner repeatedly. However, knowing this, we don't have to stick to the decisions that we made while being in effect, once the storm subsides. And with time, we learn to catch ourselves before our emotions get the best of us. At first, we can just watch as the emotional chaos unfolds, and we react as we've always done. But if we're observant, we can notice that we've put a subtle distance between ourselves and what is happening. We're no longer completely identified with the movie that is playing inside our heads. Already here, our neurology has begun to change. And the more we observe, the more it will change, until, one day, we nip our reaction to the triggering event in the bud before our mind has the chance to make something of it. In other words, self-observation can be challenging at first. It requires effort and persistence. It may even seem daunting because it necessitates the shattering of long-held beliefs about ourselves and the world around us. Gurdjieff made this point clear in his first volume of All and Everything series, where he states his aim of destroying, mercilessly, without any compromises whatsoever, in the mentation and feelings of the reader, the beliefs and views, by centuries rooted in him, about everything existing in the world. However, it is only through this process of self-observation and the subsequent de-identification with our changing personalities that we can access the deeper part of ourselves. This deeper self is stable, unchanging, and is our true identity. External events or internal reactions do not influence it. It simply observes, understands, and learns. Let me repeat that. It simply observes, understands, and learns. Here you have fertile ground for growth. Practicing self-observation, then, 
becomes a path towards freedom from our automatic responses and towards a more intentional, conscious existence. It gives us a choice. A choice to respond rather than react, a choice to act out of understanding rather than habit. In Meetings with Remarkable Men, Gurdjieff illustrates the power of self-observation through his encounters with various men who have attained remarkable wisdom and understanding. These men have used self-observation to peel back the layers of their personalities, reach their true selves, and live consciously. In conclusion, to put self-observation into practice, start by noticing your thoughts, emotions, and reactions as they occur throughout the day. Remember to be an impartial observer. Do not judge or analyze what you observe. Just notice. Gradually, you will start to see patterns, recognize your habitual responses, and discern the different personalities within you. As I already said, in the beginning, you can just observe yourself acting as you always have. But, over time, as you practice self-observation, you'll find that you're able to create a gap between your thoughts and emotions, and your response to them. In this gap lies your freedom of choice. With time, practice and patience, you can begin to decide how you want to respond rather than reacting automatically. If you understand this, the first big step on this journey has already been taken. Because the first step is to recognizing the automatic reactions for what they are, instead of identifying with them, and thus assigning a free will to them that just isn't there. That's all for today. If you liked the video, hit the like button, as this helps the video to get noticed. Also, feel free to share it on social media and other places. And if you want to see more of my content, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you always get notified of new videos. I post content every day, and I do my best to always offer something valuable. Also, check out the description and comment section for more things that me and my wife are doing. Thank you for your time.